everyone. Uh, welcome to another webinar from the Beef Reproduction Task Force. Uh, this is our spring webinar series. My name is Vitor Mercadante. I'm an associate professor at Virginia Tech and also currently the chair of the Beef Reproduction Task Force. And it's always a great pleasure to host um, this series and um, catch up with everybody, share some great information and um, enjoy some Q&A time, uh, which we always look forward to. Uh, I wanna start really briefly um, thanking our sponsors because without them, we can't do this uh, series. So I really wanna thank uh, AstroTech, Ripper Logics, Boringen, uh, Boringer Ingenheim, Ingen sorry, BI, uh, Animal Health, Merck, Animal Health, Elanco Animal Health, and the Texas A&M uh, Pregnancy and Developmental Programming um, Group over there, A&M. So again, thank you very much for our sponsors. We really appreciate the support, uh, not only just for the spring webinar, but our all the events and our meetings uh, that we do throughout the year. Um, just a couple of housekeeping um, messages here before we get started. Um, you see that we have a Q&A box that is uh, on your Zoom. So we're gonna use that um, to do all our questions and answers. We're gonna do uh, answer the questions towards the end of the webinar. So I'm not gonna do during, but if you have any questions at any point, you can type them there. And then uh, at the end, uh, once our two presenters um, finish their presentation, we're gonna go um, and, and try and answer as many questions as we can, okay? Uh, I wanna remind everybody that this is being uh, recorded and uh, will be later posted on our, um, our YouTube channel, okay? So uh, if, if you can't watch the whole webinar or if there's somebody that you know that wants to watch and wanna send this way, um, later on to somebody, wanna watch it again, um, please go to our YouTube channel uh, so that you can access not only just this webinar, but all the webinars and several other talks from our previous meetings, okay? So um, we go today we have two amazing speakers, uh, two people that I've known for, for a little while now and have had the pleasure to work with. Uh, we have Dr. Niki Oshduzin. Uh, Niki is a uh, sales manager and reproductive specialist for ABS. Um, and we have Dr. Christina Porter, who is a large animal vet uh, based in Huron, South Dakota, and is also a ABS sales rep. Um, between the two of them, there's a lot of knowledge and all, a lot of experience working with AI and beef cattle. Um, so we're really excited about today's presentation so that they can, um, you know, share some of the, their experiences, some, um, you know, ideas and, and tips to really uh, set yourself up for success um, when doing artificial insemination. So, um, Nikki, I believe who's going to go first? I'm going to go ahead and get us started. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you, Chris. The floor is yours. Well, thanks, Vitor. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nikki Westhazen, as Vitor said. I'm going to get us started off this evening, um, and tonight, Christina Porter and I are going to be sharing a little bit of our experience out in the field, and we're going to be talking about how you can set yourself up for success when using artificial insemination. So just a little bit of background on me. I am from South Africa. That's why I do have this accent. I did my undergrad there, and then I came over here to the United States to do my master's degree at the University of Florida, as well as my PhD in physiology of reproduction at Texas A&M University. Both of these degrees I did with Dr. Cliff Lamb, and I specialized in estrus synchronization protocols and basically how to improve reproduction in your herd. And once I graduated, I moved up to South Dakota to work for ABS Global, where I am now the reproduction specialist on the beef team. And then I'm also the sales manager for South and North Dakota, as well as Northwestern Iowa and Southwestern Minnesota. So now I'm just gonna turn it over to Christina so that she can introduce herself. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. We've been really excited about that. Um, 
I, I hope you enjoyed the pictures Nikki put up of us. Most of the time when we see each other, we're covered in manure from head to toe. So that's uh, that's our bonding time. And when we get to discuss the victories and the things we screwed up. So we get to share all of those with you tonight because we, along with experience comes uh, victories and things you do wrong, uh, which I guess is why they, they let us talk. Um, I did go to Kansas State for my animal science and my DVM down there worked under some phenomenal professors. But other than that, I probably have a very, very different background than most of your speakers. I'm not in the academic world. I am out in the trenches. Those of you who are producers, I understand. Um, I'm there, there right with you, wrapping up a pretty awful calving season here in South Dakota. So we we deal with everything that you deal with in, in real life. So trying to get other people's cows bred as well as our own. So I am I'm so appreciative of our academic world and the things that they teach us. Um, but I, I also understand that real life presents some different challenges. So we're going to talk about a lot of those things today, just the, the real life um, troubles and how we can work through some of those. Uh, I am uh, just a large animal veterinarian in, in eastern South Dakota, but I grew up following my dad around. He was an ABS representative, so learned how to breed cows as soon as I was tall enough to reach one, and um, I've continued to help him with that. Uh, not, not very many vets breed cattle as a part of their practice, but I've found that it's, it's a perfect Part of our practice. I get to see the whole thing and, and work with um, every aspect of, of these cows life cycle. It's, it's really fun to be a part of. Okay, Nikki. Okay, so just to walk you through what we're going to be discussing with you all tonight, we're just going to briefly talk about how you can get started with artificial insemination. If you've never done it, you've never incorporated before, where do you start? Then we're going to go through what to do before breeding day, estrus synchronization and timed AI in herds of different sizes, how to manage reproduction, and then we're going to finish this webinar off with some tips for a successful breeding season, some things that you can maybe think about or incorporate into your herd to achieve the best pregnancy success. So before we get started, I just want to go over some of the reproductive management strategies that are currently utilized in the, the United States. So looking at this figure, this is data taken from a USDA National Animal Health Monitoring System survey a couple years ago. And this is the percentage of operations that adopt these reproductive management strategies and the actual strategy is on the bottom at the x-axis. So if we look over to the left, you'll notice that about 40% of our producers actually have a controlled breeding season, whereas about 30% incorporate pregnancy diagnosis, about 30% incorporate a breeding soundness exam, and then if we look over here on the right, if we look at these reproductive strategies, you'll notice that only about 7% of producers actually incorporate estrus synchronization and only about 12% incorporate artificial insemination. So when we break these numbers down according to herd size, it's very interesting to see that as herd size increases, that the adoption of these technologies actually increases as well. So these red bars represent small herds, for less than 50 head. The gray bars are those medium herds up to 199 head. And then these white bars are those herds that are considered large that have 200 or more or more head. So if you look here in these white bars, you'll see that quite a lot more of these larger operations incorporate artificial insemination and estrus synchronization. I just want to share some of this data from a research project that was done in South Dakota quite a few years ago. And this is just looking at the data, not according to what was actually being studied at the time, but we, we wanted to look at the data by location. We wanted to see the pregnancy rates by location. So if you look at these different herds, what was noticed was that a couple of these herds got pregnancy rates that were above 50%, which are shown here in the pink. And some of these herds uh, had pregnancy rates that were below 50%, which are shown here in the blue bars. And 
these herds were very similar. They had similar cows, they had similar bulls that were used for AI. And it was the same person that was actually doing the artificial insemination as well. So we, we basically wanted to know what was different among these herds. Why did some of these herds get above 50% and some of them get below 50% when a lot of these factors were very similar? And when we looked at them, when we, we broke it down to see what was different between these three herds that had these really good pregnancy rates, when we compared it to the rest of them, what we noticed that one of the main differences that we found was that these three herds had been using artificial insemination for at least five years. So these herds that had pregnancy rates below 50% had either just started using AI or had only been using AI for a couple of years. But it seems that those that stuck through and kept at it, they were the ones that were achieving these pregnancy rates above 50%. And we, I guess when trying to think of why this would be the case, we went back and looked at the calving season, um, the calving season data. And what we can see here is this, this top figure represents those herds that had those pregnancy rates that were greater than 50%. And the gray bars at the bottom represent those herds with pregnancy rates of less than 50%. You'll notice that those herds that had crude pregnancy rates, their calving distribution is shifted far over to the left. So what's happening is these herds that are using AI for multiple years, they're able to shift their calving distribution earlier. So more of these females are being born near to the beginning of the calving season. And so the average days postpartum at the beginning of the next breeding season in this top herd is about 79 days. And if we look at the bottom herd, it's about 64 days. So incorporating AI, continuing on, keep doing it because it helps to shift your calving distribution and your females are more ready to breed at the start of the next breeding season. So they're more likely to become pregnant. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Christina so she can go, go through how to actually get started with artificial insemination if you've never done it before. And one thing I would add to that, you can tell from that, that there's definite benefits to sticking with it. I do tell all my first year people, this is a five year project. Do not do this one year and give up because you got frustrated by it. If we're going to go through this, if we're going to get started, let's be committed to it so that you can see those benefits. Give it a few years and, and I think you'll be really impressed with how it can change your herd. So I get calls this time of year a lot. Uh, I want to I wanna breed my cows. I want to try this AI thing. What do I do? So I would absolutely never say yes or no to a job. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions before, uh, before we would agree to, to come and breed your cows. And what I really want to do is see what, why, why this year? What's your goal with AI? Uh, when did your calves, when do you turn your bulls out? When was your first calf born? Um, if, if we haven't started calving season, that's great. I like planning ahead early, but when do you expect your first calf? When do you expect your last calf? As you can tell from those slides that Nikki showed you, those, those postpartum days are probably the, the biggest thing to show us whether we're going to be successful or not. So if you're calving until July 1st, we can't breed July 1st and have success. So let, let's see who of your cows are even going to be eligible to be bred, and then we'll pick our protocol, we'll, we'll do those kind of things um, after we know what we're dealing with. I want to know what vaccines your cows and your heifers especially have been given, kind of what you do throughout the year so I can get a feel for your herd and the kind of success that I think we'll be able to have there. I want to know how many open cows you end up with. Are you a high fertility herd? Are you a herd that struggles year after year? A quote from our dear favorite Dr. Cliff Lamb said, producers should use synchronization and AI to enhance the profitability, the profitability of a well-managed operation and should not use synchronization to obtain a well-managed operation. If you're having 20% open cows, if the bulls can't get them bred, we probably won't either. So I wanna know why you're doing this and what, what your expectations are. I wanna know what your facilities are. Does it stress you out to run cattle through? Do 
Is it easy for you? Do you enjoy it? Do you have the labor around? Where are your cattle gonna be? We don't want these cattle shifted around after we breed them. So we wanna plan our breeding in a place they're gonna stay or they can easily move to. So we're gonna get lots of information and then we'll make a plan from there. Most people start with breeding their heifers first. It's just the simplest. Uh, cows, they can just be a pain. They're usually out to grass. Um, there's calves to sort off. So if you're talking running cows through three, four times, whatever it might be, you have to think about those calves too and the stress that's on them and the people. So most people start with heifers, get their feet wet, and then can add on from there those heifers chances are that you've moved your calving date up a little maybe not your first calf but you've grouped them up by your AIing, and that group is going to be a very good candidate for the next year to synchronize and start breeding your cows so we want to look at the heifers um are they ready are they cycling when were they born what kind of body condition score are they and then we want to know where they're going to be we want to know if they're going to stay up in the lot. We can talk about an MGA protocol. If they're going to be out in pasture, we'll need to look at cedars. So I'm going to need all that information. And then what your strengths as an operation are. Do you have extra people around? Do you have extra time on your hands? Do you have to gather up every neighbor to where the fewer times through the shoot, the better? Or do you have four high schoolers that are wonderful cheap labor and, and that doesn't really matter. So all those things factor into the protocol that we're gonna pick for you and how we're gonna to wanna to proceed. If we are talking about cows, I love breeding cows, absolutely love it. But we really need to know when they're calving to know if there is even a chance we can get them bred. Uh, body condition of those cows are super, super important. South Dakota, the calving season that we had right now, cows look tough, they're pretty thin. We wanna make sure that they're in good enough shape that, that we will be able to have success. How late do you calve? How long is your breeding season? Do we need to split it into two groups? Are they all eligible to be bred at one time or do we need an early group and a late group? So we really take a close look at those postpartum days and see what, what cows we even have a chance to get bred. Oh, so I, we talk a lot about this 45 days. There's not a hard and fast rule. Um, I really like them being 45 days postpartum before we put a cedar in. That way they're at least 50 days when we, when we breed them is kind of what I'm shooting for. Some cows are ready earlier. A hard winter like this one, they, they might be later. Sometimes it's worth putting a cedar in those later calving cows even if we can't get them AI'd, we can move them up a little as bull bred cows so they have a chance next year. What protocol you're going to use, we're going to talk more about that later. But we need to know who's breeding these cows. Is it one person who's loading his own guns and it's going to be a 50 head in a day is a lot? Or is a crew coming in with eight people that we can get through 600 without breaking a sweat? So your herd size is going to determine the kind of kind of people you need on a crew and uh, the, the experience of your inseminator or technician. And we need to know where you are, whether coming more than one time is even an option, or do we just need to get who we can get bred and then make a plan with bulls for the rest of them? So now I just wanna walk you guys through a case study that was done by Dr. Cliff Lamb at the North Florida Research and Education Center. And what happened was Dr. Lamb showed up to work there in Florida and Mariana. And when he arrived, they had this herd of herd of animals that they, they would basically turn a bull out on day one and then remove the bulls about 120 days later. So they had a breeding season of 120 days just using bulls. And Dr. Lamb decided that he wanted to start artificial insemination in this herd. So what he did was the following year, he decided to just start AIing with the heifers right at the beginning of the breeding season. 
A week later, he AI'd the cows that actually had a long enough postpartum interval. And then he, the rest of these cows, he grouped into late calving cows and late, late calving cows. So basically just giving them a little bit more time in which to start cycling before he exposed them to artificial insemination. Then he also had cleaner bulls at the end and he removed these bulls at 110 days. Two years later, he had managed to get rid of the late, late calving cow group. So he was just left with two cow groups. And this is just because he employed uh, really good culling practices and he was able to get these females to cycle up a little bit by using estrus synchronization protocols that incorporate a cedar insert. So by 2012, the late calving cows and the late late calving cows had both been removed and he basically had a group of heifers to AI and a week later all of these cows were AI'd so the breeding season was reduced from 120 days down to 70 days and the, the way in which he was able to do that is by breaking these females up into groups by intensively using estrus synchronization and fixed timed AI. He culled non-pregnant females and less fertile females then he kept replacement heifers that conceived within the first 21 days. So that's also very important because those females are more likely to cycle back then um, for their second breeding season. So every year he was able to decrease the length of the breeding season by about 10 days. So it is possible, but you do have to start somewhere. If you've got a breeding season that takes place over 120 days, you're not going to necessarily get down to a 70 day breeding season unless you have very heavy culling practices, but over a period of years, it can be done quite successfully. Absolutely, you have to start somewhere. So don't be intimidated that that this is impossible. There is always a way and sometimes you do just have to jump in and, and we can adjust from there as the years go on. Before breeding day, there's a lot of things to worry about. I, I hope if you get anything else from this that you realize we can't come in with four different success tips about that day and you have a good AI season. It starts long, long before that. Most of what we have to talk about today is actually things that take place long before that day we breed. Vaccinations. This is this is a new thing that um, a lot of people, even a lot of veterinarians, are not, not adjusting um, to the new research. The companies have always told us that that preg, preg guard pre-breeding pre vaccine, whatever it is, that you're using needs to be 30 days before, we're seeing that 30 days is not enough. We want those vaccines in at least 45 days before. Uh, I would prefer 60 days. So if it's after January 1st in South Dakota, if you if you have a spring breeding season, if we're running those heifers through the chute, we're going to make sure that preg, uh, pre breeding vaccine gets into them because we would rather it be on the early side than on the late side. We do not want to, when we show up to breed here, that you ran them through quick last week and, and gave them their shots. Even that 30 days is just, just not enough time. We want these animals acclimated to their environment. If they're going to be bred out in pasture, if we can get them out early so they can adjust to the feed, to the distance they're going to walk, to their new life, we're going to have better success. We really, really care about the body condition of these cattle. That's going to change when they start cycling and what kind of success we can have. We want them on an increasing plane of nutrition. Cattle are going to take care of themselves first before they allow themselves to get pregnant and have to take care of another baby. So we need to make sure their needs are all met and then they will let, let that body do what we're asking it to do. There's some really, really good numbers out there on, on body condition score. This study is so interesting to me. This, this top graph is showing the percent of cows cycling at the start of the breeding season. So the day you turned bulls in, when the season was actually starting, a four and a half body condition score is that cow that she's not dying, she's not emaciated, but she's just a little on the thin side. She just needs a little bit more. Only half of those cows will even be cycling. And we're showing up and asking the whole group to get bred on one day. 
if we get those cows, even at a five, I, I would not walk into a pasture and think that there's something wrong with your cows if they were body condition score of five. And we're still talking only 60% of those cows are cycling. So if we can have our cows in good shape, there's just that many more of them that can even respond to the sync protocols that we're trying to do. So I hope that this slide too really stands out to you. If they're thin going into calving season, we're gonna have trouble on breeding day. And if we're putting that time and money into AI, I would really put the effort into starting before winter to make sure you have them in the shape that you want to. The kind of the same thing on the bottom, you can see that those thin cows, they, they are just not cycling. We don't need them obese, but we do need them in good shape, their body to do what we want it to. There's lots of other things that can cause delays. When we're talking cows, we're, you know, we want that 50 days at least, but if those cows are thin, if they have any kind of metabolic disease, if you pulled that calf, that 50 days is not enough. They're gonna take longer than that. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Another reason to use bulls that don't cause you problems, that cow is gonna recover much faster if, if calving season went well for her. Take care of those uterine infections. Yes, they'll get rid of them on their own, but that cow will probably end up open at the end of the season because it just takes her longer to start cycling again. If we're talking first calf heifers, we very well might be closer to 100 days before she is ready to be bred again. Another reason to get, get those heifers early to keep those heifers that calve in the first 21 days so they have that extra time. I cannot talk about a successful breeding season without talking about low stress handling. It just can't be separated and that wasn't what we were asked to talk about, but you gotta bear with me for a minute here. There are three super, super important days in the life of that heifer that are going to affect her on breeding day. The day she's born, we have to have that mama and baby bond. She has to get her colostrum. We want her nursing frequently for her health, for the social status of the herd. There are so many reasons. Branding vaccines or spring turnout, whatever it is that you run those calves through, that is an opportunity for us to impact that, that calf. It's our chance to teach her we're not the bad guys. We can use them as training opportunities. Everything we're doing up until that point is preparing that heifer calf for weaning so that she can gain weight, get to the body condition we want and be ready for the breeding season. Now, a lot of times on these heifers you bought them, you had no control over those three days. We understand that we AI a lot of bought and heifers that we have no idea their history and that's okay. The day they arrive on your farm, that is your first opportunity. How they get on the truck, how they're cared for from the day they step on your place is when our successful AI season starts. We uh, stress, stress is just anything unknown. It can be unknown where my food's coming from, or it can be unknown coyote or unknown human predator. Anything that makes you nervous is a stress in your life. And those psychological stresses might even have a greater impact than the physical stress. And you might know that you're no actual threat to that cow, but if she sees you as a threat, that is just as dangerous as if you actually are are a threat. And acclimation, handling these animals in the correct way, can dissipate so much of that psychological stress. Some of our most successful places have seen all this cedar work as a chance to interact with those calves and change those calves. The next video is from a client of mine, and this is on the day that, oh, I think they were putting cedars in this day. So each time putting cedars in, oh, oh I forgot forgot about those pictures. Thanks, Nikki. The animals, animals have very different degrees of stress. That one up on the right is, is a patient of mine, but the stress that certain animals feel is so different. There's a reason we don't AI buffalo herds. They're never going to respond the way we want them to respond because they will see us as a threat. Those other pictures are not tame animals. The, the middle one, red cow, that was on breeding day. She's separated from her calf. She has every reason to be nervous, 
that she's as calm as can be. Our positive interactions with these animals can make a huge difference in our success during the breeding season. Okay, now onto our video. We've had clients that have really embraced all this. Instead of looking at it as a chore to run these animals through, instead they see it as an opportunity to work with these calves. So after, actually, I think this one was on breeding day. We pulled our breeding barn out of the way. They opened up the alley and these calves all ran through it. This is not the first time they've done this. They did it the day cedars went in, the day cedars came out, and the day we bred. And when those calves go to get their weaning vaccines, they are not afraid of that shoot. They're not afraid of the people that are handling them. This took them, this last time, it took them 10 minutes to run 80 calves through and then get packed back up. We all have 10 extra minutes for a positive interaction with these calves. And when those heifers get bred, it does not stress them out to run through the chute. They have been put through the chute like this and nothing scary happens. So when they come in for their cedar, it's just not a big deal. And you can, we have seen a huge change in this herd from them doing these little things during the breeding season. So when you're tempted to complain about what we're asking you to do, instead see it as an opportunity for something positive. Thanks, Chris. I definitely agree with you. So I'm, I'm just going to shift gears here and move on to a subject of different herd sizes. How do we approach artificial insemination and estrus synchronization in herds of different sizes? So herd size, it does matter. It does matter because it influences the logistics of artificial insemination. Larger herds, we need more laborers. However, it might be cheaper per head that you're gonna be working, but it's likely gonna require more time to actually complete your work. So timing of AI does become a little bit more important when we're considering a larger herd because the, the window is a little bit smaller. And so to figure out when to work animals becomes a little bit more intricate. A lot of the times what we've seen out there in the field is that larger herds do tend to have better facilities and animal handling a lot of the times, just because it, it's likely a larger part of the day to day. But there is definitely less room for mistakes when you're working with a larger herd. Smaller herds, Equipment and facilities might not be as good as those of the larger herds, but you also might require less labor. So an example of a small herd would be maybe 30 to 50 females. With these smaller herds, heat detection is likely a more viable option because there's fewer animals to actually go through and sort out and you do tend to have a larger breeding window. But on the other hand, handling facilities and labor might not be up to par as, as um, let's say for example, a larger herd because cattle might just be a very small part of the income stream for these smaller herds. And for larger herds, it likely makes up a bigger proportion of that income. A lot of the time with small herds, because there aren't a lot of permanent employees necessarily, people might get their neighbors or friends to come over and help with the cattle handling, which is great, but it's always important for people to know how to work with cattle so that they keep the cattle handling stress to a minimum. So it's important if you've also got children helping out with the work, you know, that, that kids aren't running around with a hot shot or hot shotting every female that's coming through the alleyway to get to the chute. And these facilities, they might be less frequently used. So it's important to note the state of repair that these facilities are in. Now, when we're setting up a large herd and Christina, feel free to jump in if you need to. An example would be 500 heifers. Now to a lot of you, that sounds crazy. It sounds impossible to work 500 heifers. So a lot of the time we might split them into smaller groups, maybe groups of 150 or 250, but there are other things that you've got to consider when you're setting up a large herd. For example, how many bulls are you going to be using? Are you, how many AI technicians are you going to have? Because in a larger herd like this, you definitely need to have more um, people able to step in and breed. 
Are you going to be breeding in a single shoot or are you able to incorporate a breeding barn, which is shown there in the top right hand corner? Timing of AI is definitely more important, as I mentioned to you before, because the first animal versus the last animal, if it takes you five hours to run these, these animals through, there is a discrepancy between when you've actually pulled the cedar and when you're actually artificially inseminating them. This is a video I just want to share with you. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the breeding barn, this is how the breeding barn works. A female is let in and uh, the breeder pulls a rope that drops a bar behind that female and the AI technician can come in safely behind and artificially inseminate that female. And two people can be breeding at the same time, which definitely helps with the flow of things. Once that female is bred, the front door is closed off and that AI tech can go and wait for a new female. And that was Christina in that video, if, if you guys weren't um, aware. So as I mentioned, you definitely need to have good handling capabilities for a large herd. When you're breeding, you don't want to have to wait for cattle in the chute. You want to have a good flow. You don't want cattle coming in stressed either because that stress can affect your overall pregnancy rate to AI, which is what you're actually trying to protect against. You, you want the best pregnancy rate that you can get. If you, you've got a cow going down, for example, in the alleyway or the chute, make sure you have the means to fix a situation like that as soon as possible because that can cause huge delays and stress, especially in these larger herds. Another thing, don't wait until breeding day to figure out that there are issues with your facilities or things like that. Try and be prepared before breeding day, as Christina mentioned earlier. With these larger herds, the time to pull cedars is a little bit more important because the faster you get those cedars pulled, the greater window you have for fixed timed artificial insemination. So what we like to do out in the field is to record the time between the first and last animal at cedar pull and figure out an average to that. And then from that average, calculate the, the time that you need for that protocol. And that's where you want the average between your first and last animal coming through at artificial insemination. So you're gonna need to know how fast um, your AI technicians, for example, work, how many they can get through in a certain period of time to work that out. So timing at AI is important, and that goes for the speed of the technician, your gun loader, and the animal flow, because the technician can set the speed for the whole day, as well as the gun loader. So everybody needs to be working together to get the best outcome. You've got to know your AI technician's capabilities. How many head can they actually breed per hour? That, that also helps you out to figure out your actual timed AI window. You also need to know your gun loader capabilities. Are they handling semen correctly? Are they using the correct semen from your tank? They need to also be able to keep up with those technicians. Your handling setup is important because that affects the flow of cattle that I've mentioned to you before. It's really, really great to have your alley leading into a chute and having injections being able to give in, in the chute because I know a lot of people do give injections in the alleyways, but there are definitely injuries that can happen and definitely do happen, as well as incorrect administration of your hormones, which is a very important part of estrus synchronization, is giving those hormones correctly. Your shoot, if you just have a single breeder, uh, the animal could be bred in the shoot, or that shoot could then lead into a breeding barn. This is really helpful because you can have one animal ready to go into the breeding barn at a time and it avoids overcrowding of that breeding barn as well. If you're working your females out in a pasture, you definitely need to set up a large pen first to be able to corral those females before they, it leads into an alleyway and then to the chute. So this is just a video. There were, I think, five of us working this day we were able to work 600 heifers with the five of us giving shots and putting in cedars, scanning females. We were able to do it within about five hours. And the reason for that is just because of the handling setup. Everything worked smoothly and everything was in a good condition. So if you do have a good handling setup and good help, you are able to 
get through a lot of females a lot faster. This next video is just to show how we can actually breed large herds of heifers out in the pasture. So firstly, before we get to the timed AI, we need to gather these females up and it, it is quite simple to do it on horseback when you've got enough people. We basically push these females all to one side where they're then able to enter into a corral that's waiting for them with an alleyway and a chute. So I'll turn it over to Christina to explain what's going on in this video. Yeah, so you'll notice in that video they were walking up nice and slowly running them around the pasture is not helpful to what we do up up top their body heat rises they're stressed people are stressed you know you're in for a rough day when you see them running full speed even if they're running into the corral that's what we really really like to see they're riding like crazy they their hormones are going crazy so take your time be patient with them so i believe this is actually at the same place isn't it, Nikki? It is. So that's the same, exactly group. same day. Okay. The same herd. The same group that was being gathered here. We are absolutely in the middle of a big open pasture. This particular facility has enough um, portable panels that that was no problem to gather those 600 head. Now, what we used to do here, most years there's somewhere around the 1,200 heifers to breed. You can absolutely breed them in one day if you need to. We always worry about the weather getting too hot. Uh, heifers, the protocol they're on, we end up breeding in the afternoon. So we do split these 1,200 heifers into two groups. We usually have a five to 600 head group. And we used to split those. We would pull cedars on half of them, shut them in a different pasture, then pull the second. Then we'd wait an hour and pull the second group of cedars. A couple of years they got mixed up. So instead of instead of trusting that there, somebody didn't open the gate and accidentally let our two groups together, which which happened at least one of those two years, we decided to try a different method. And we have two alleys, two shoots, two breeding barns set up. So we actually only showed up at this place with four AI technicians, which we would have done four technicians if we were just in one barn with a group of this size, but these 600 head, um, it, we got them bred in no time at all to where it was it was not a problem. We did not have to split them again. We did this two days in a row and um, and it saved us a lot of trouble on, on cedar pulling day and the ease of pastures and all. So here we, uh, we did, again, we didn't have extra technicians. You probably should, but we figured if somebody got hurt, if something went wrong, we actually had a breakdown in one of the in one of the breeding barns. The guys in the back didn't even notice. They kept going on the other breeding barn until we got the other one fixed. Uh, we try to always think of the worst case scenario, whether it be a flat tire on the way to the place or shoot breaking down. You know, we figure our timing accordingly. Nikki does the average. I figure if the cow that comes in first to get his, her cedar pulled comes in last on breeding day, are we still okay time-wise? And, and that's how I decide if that they need to be split up or not. So there's lots of different ways to look at it, but either way, plan for things to go wrong. Cause if you're hanging out with me, something will go wrong. But this is, this is just a fun project that I used to sweat about. Now it's, it is not a hard day at all. It just takes a little more planning and preparation and being organized. And there is We've never gotten a call for a size of job that, that really scares us. I think absolutely anything can be done. You just have to have the right people on your team and, and plan ahead, and it would not be an issue at all. Oh, is it still me? Okay, here's the question of the day. This is my most frequently asked question. What protocols should I use? And when you tell them it's okay, they're all good, you're going to hear back, but no, which one's the best? There's got to be one that's the best. Uh, they're good protocols. Don't lose sleep over this. The Reproduction Task Force has done such a phenomenal job. If it is listed there on the back of your AI directory, whatever company you're using, I can assure you that we have used all of them. And we are not seeing differences out in the field. I know that they have little differences in the research, but from a real life scenario, 
pick the protocol that works for you. Pick the protocol that works for your people, that your people and your cattle are going to be the least stressed and trust this group. And I'm not, I'm not one of them. So I, I'm not biased here, but these guys have done such a phenomenal job. The kind of cattle that you put in these protocols is much, much more important than which protocol you pick. So here's, here's an example. This is all, oh, these are actually almost all the same age of cattle. Uh, just a couple years difference here. This is the same year. This is 2021. So pretty recent data, six pastures. All six of these pastures were bred within 10 days. This is a herd that we have great success with. But when I glance at that, the first thing that stands out to me is that 44%. Uh, you know, the owner kind of blew it off. He said, yeah, win some, lose some. It's okay. I was sick. And I absolutely lost sleep over that 44% wondering what in the world was different. These cattle, a lot of them had calved together, moved to different pastures. But I, I was very, very confused why we would have a year like that, that everything else is 59% and above. And that one was 44%. Those other two, 16, these are one day breedings on all these pastures, same people breeding them. This is my crew doing the AIing, same people putting cedars in, little different grass, but really similar places. So I would look at this and say, okay, what, what protocol did you use on that 44%? Because obviously something's different. I, I don't want that protocol. So you'll see right there, we have the five day cedar protocol. But look down a little farther, five day cedars, 67%. It is not the protocol. We got so excited about the seven and seven sink. I got calls right and left, people thinking they were guaranteed 12% better if they use this new life-changing protocol. It's not a life-changing protocol. It's a good protocol. It's a very good protocol, but they're all good protocols. The cattle that you put into these protocols need to be in good shape, need to have an updates postpartum, and you're going to have success. Our next worst one there was that 59%. That was on sex semen. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. We did have a little bit of conventional in there. The conventional average 63%, but the, the whole thing with most of it being sex was 59%. So still the question is what happened to that 44%? I will take all the blame for that. I usually ask a lot of questions. The question I didn't ask is which cattle were going into which pasture. I knew which cattle we were breeding, but it just so happened that that pasture one was the first one I put on the schedule, the first one of the year that we bred there, and they were the last ones to calve. They were about 15 days less postpartum, maybe even closer to 20 days less postpartum than those other groups were. Right there's your difference the next year, we simply took that pasture, moved it to the last group we bred instead of the first group, and it got much better. You cannot give enough information to the people helping you plan this, and they cannot ask enough questions. Uh, if I would have asked a couple more questions, I, I think we would have not had a 44% there, but live and learn, and, and we, we fixed it the next year. So, okay, next slide, Nikki. As a veterinarian, uh, it does matter who breeds your cows in the sense that there's some people who maybe, maybe do really, really well on a 20, 30 head, but they shouldn't be breeding a large group of cattle. I understand that, but for the most part, our successful herds and our non-successful herds, we as AI technicians are doing the exact same thing every time. So to be successful, I think it has much more to do with what you do our, all year long. You make us look good. Uh, the details matter. When you get those vaccines in matter, how the vaccine is handled, how it's given, and the mineral program you're on, that those cows are not deficient. The other thing I'd say is there, there's a lot of competition between veterinarians, nutritionists, the guy at the feed store selling you your vaccine, AI technicians, we all want to be the, the go-to for advice. There's no reason we should com be competing with each other. My larger clients, I have their nutritionists on speed dial. When there's a problem, we all get on the phone together. 
we try to work through it together. And I think we can be so, so much more successful if we work on a team. Go ahead. Okay. I believe the last webinar was about the Esther Sync Planner. I, I got through part of it and then kids were calling me, so I did not get it finished. But, oh, you guys, what a gift from the task force. If you are not using the Esther Sync Planner, you are missing out. It makes my life so much easier. We won't go through explaining how to use it, but this is a tool you need. This has stopped me from making so many mistakes. Uh, just let it do the adding for you and the counting hours for you, and you you will be thankful. There is a multi um, multi herd. I don't remember what what wording they use. Multi group planner. I don't use that. Old habits die hard. I had my other ways of copying and pasting. So I'll just show you a couple examples of what I do. You can get a sheet just like this with your one herd. Every client of mine gets sent that. But this particular herd has four different groups of cattle on MGA. So it gets complicated. They quit feeding one group of heifers and start breeding the other group. And you cannot be organized enough. There's one of these in, in everybody's pocket in the tractor that they're feeding. So they can double check every morning and make sure that they're feeding the right pen. So this is, I just copy and pasted from the Esther Sync Planner, put it into an Excel document. And the only reason I do it this way is because I like to color code things and my little weird ways of doing things. I copy and paste so I can change what I want to change. And right here on two sheets of paper, they have half their summer planned. And it, it has saved a whole lot of mistakes. So I have one more example for you of a, another rather complicated one. It's called the calendar of fun because one person at the ranch called it the calendar of misery and it really ticked me off. So now they all get calendar of fun across the top of it because it it is, it's fun when it's done right. It's a blessing to work on these animals. So again, color-coded pastures. I started with the Esther Sync Planner. I just put in the pasture name and I, I put in the CCs and the drug on absolutely every day. This particular operation, 20 employees, chances of somebody grabbing the wrong drug is pretty high at some point. We have been breeding at this place for, I believe, 20 years. Seven to nine groups of cattle, three times through the shoot, a piece at least, some protocols, it's more than that. This could be the year, but for 20 years, the wrong drug has never been given at the wrong time, whether time of day or cedar pole. And it is because everyone walks around with one of these in their pocket and we are all double checking on each other. This herd calls me when they start and when they finish on absolutely every group. And I write in my notebook, what time they started pulling cedars, what time they finished pulling cedars. And then I know what time we need to show up to breed and fingers crossed, hopefully this isn't the year, but 20 years, all those trips through the shoot. And so far, just because of extreme communication, we, we have not had any mistakes in that regard. So be organized, don't assume anything, double check, and it'll get you through those big jobs in pretty good shape. Great. Thanks, Chris. So I'm going to finish off our presentation tonight with some tips for you guys to have a successful breeding season. So if we think about our pregnancy rate to AI that we achieve in the end, it's not just one single thing that affects that pregnancy rate, right? There are so many different factors that are all working together to give you your final pregnancy rate. Things like your semen, it's fertility, it's handling, your nutrition, are you supplementing your females, do you have a mineral program, health, vaccinations, are you giving them correctly at the right time, estrus synchronization, are you following the protocol guidelines, are you stressing your females unnecessarily, there are so many things that you've actually got to take into consideration, but at the same time, you don't have to worry about every single one of these little things. Because as Christina mentioned above, 
you have a whole team available to you. Work with your AI technician, work with your nutritionist. There's so many resources out there to you. Work with your extension specialist. All of these people can work together to help you achieve the best pregnancy rate to AI. So what can you do from your side? How can you help your pregnancy rate to AI? So let's start before the actual artificial insemination. What can you do leading up to EstraSync and timed AI? First, you obviously want to have a large proportion of your herd cycling because when females are cycling, that means that they can actually become pregnant. And a lot of the cyclicity goes back to adequate nutrition and body condition score. So you, you definitely wanna be managing your nutrition before, during and after AI, not just before. But also, as we mentioned earlier, if you have your females bred to AI and they're bred early in the breeding season, and they calve early in the calving season, they've got more time in which to actually undergo involution. So more of them are likely to be cycling at the time of your next breeding season. As Christina mentioned above, we wanna try and have your females vaccinated by at least 45 days prior to AI. And this goes back to some of Dr. Perry's research where he saw that females that were vaccinated at least 45 days prior to AI had the lowest reduction in pregnancy rates. Something that maybe not everybody takes into as much consideration, but performing breeding soundness exams on your clean apples. Make sure that those clean apples, when they get out into that pressure, they're actually able to do that job and catch those females that have not become pregnant to AI. So you wanna be doing these breeding soundness exams at least 30 to 60 days before breeding, so that if there is a problem or you need to replace those bulls, you still have time to do so. And so using a bull ratio of about 25 to one is generally adequate, but you also need to make sure that these, these bulls are actively breeding your females because maybe they pass the breeding soundness exam, but when they're out in the pasture, they're just standing around eating grass, for example. You have to make sure that your bulls are actively breeding. So what can you do during, you know, once you start doing estrus synchronization and timed AI, what can you be doing to maximize your pregnancy success? So firstly and foremost, you want to make sure that you are complying with estrus synchronization protocols. Those protocols are set up for a reason because research has shown that doing things by following that recipe, you're going to get the best pregnancy rates. Make sure you're giving the correct drug on the correct day. Accidents happen, I know it, these things do happen, but try to make sure that you're only taking the drug that you need on that day out to the pasture. Make sure that you're taking GnRH when you need to be giving GnRH. Make sure you're storing your drugs when they're not in use under the correct storage conditions. Most GnRHs do need to be kept in the fridge, so make sure you're storing your GnRH in the fridge, for example. When you're administering these hormones, make sure you're using the correct needle length and drug location. If the drug says administer IM, make sure you're not giving it sub Q. And by using the correct needle length, you're able to do so. It's, it's much easier for you to give the drug and administer it in the correct location if you've got the correct needle length. If you're gonna be doing heat detection, make sure you're doing it multiple times a day. You might need to use some heat detection aids, but heat detection, make sure you're doing it correctly to as well, maximize your pregnancy success. Make sure you're getting your semen from a reputable source. Make sure that wherever you're getting it from that they have strict quality control procedures. And at the, the time of AI, make sure that the person that's handling your semen is you know, doing things according to the protocol and leading up to just before AI, make sure that you are storing your semen correctly in a nitrogen tank with the correct amount of nitrogen. You also wanna keep your stress to a minimum. I know we've spoken a lot about stress tonight, but it really does make a difference. We can definitely see the difference between locations where animals are being run through the chute, where they hit their heads into the front of the chute versus those females that come in a little bit more calmly. So try and keep your stress to a minimum. So once your AI technician has come and artificially inseminated your females, what can you do on your side to maximize your herd's productivity and pregnancy success? 
So transporting your females within the first four days after artificial insemination is recommended because that fertilized embryo has not yet actually gone and implanted in the uterus yet. So it's less susceptible to stress within those first four days. And if you cannot, then it is also advisable to wait at least 45 days after AI because research shows that these two time periods have the lowest reduction in fertility when transporting females from, for example, a feedlot to a pasture setting. Use pregnancy diagnosis as a tool. Because using pregnancy diagnosis, you're able to make a lot of good culling decisions. You want to cull your non-pregnant females, and maybe a lot of the time your females that are maybe bred a little bit later and are likely going to fall out of your breeding season next year. Because using things like pregnancy diagnosis and maintaining good herd records helps you, as I mentioned, make good culling decisions. It helps you get rid of these females that are costing you more money than they're actually accruing for you. By maintaining good herd records, you're also able to then distinguish between artificial insemination and natural service calves, which can be very useful to you as well. So I know that was a lot of information for you guys tonight, but we hope you have taken something away. So with that, we'll thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Christina, I don't know if you have anything else to say, but otherwise we'll open it up to any questions you may have. The dream team there for sure. Um, I work with both these ladies and I know they're capable of. Um, and I bred in South Dakota with Christina and it's crazy how fast we can go and how much, you know, how many cattle we can move. And it's uh, pretty fun, fun days for sure. Um, so there's quite a lot of questions already on the Q&A tab here. Um, if you have any questions, please type them up and then we're going to work through them as many as we can. Uh, we cannot stay here for too long, uh, but we're going to make sure we answer as many questions as we can. Um, I'm going to start with a, a question about uh, body condition score. Uh, there's a question about, you know, what's a good body condition score? Um, and I think there's a bit of a specific question about a slide that will show like a five and a half, six. Um, but I'm going to broaden that question to uh, what you guys consider as a good body condition score. What do you want to see? Uh, when you're breeding for most uh, success? It really depends on the place. It, Western South Dakota cattle that need to survive on rough country, we do not expect to be in a body condition score six. Um, usually in those groups, we have a little lower conception rate. Over where I am, they're eating corn silage and great grass and smaller pastures. If they're less than a five, I, I, think, I think you're being a little hard on them. So I, I have trouble answering that because it really depends on your operation and what you expect your cows to do. But I can tell you that five and a half to six, we're, we're just going to have better, better overall rates when we all get done. Mostly because you get rid of, maybe it's not your fives that are causing problems, but if you've got a bunch of fives, you've probably got a few four and a halves in there that are going to end up as our open cows at the end if that makes any sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, there's a question about how long do you guys wait or what's the recommendation for turning out the uh, cleaning up bulls mm -hmm. after AI? There isn't really a date you have to turn them out or have to wait. It just depends. Are you going to do an early prick check? Are you going to try and determine who's bred to AI or not? If you're trying to do that, you could wait, depending on your whoever's coming out to um, break check your females, you could wait seven days, you could wait 14 days. It just depends on, on that person that's coming to actually break check for you. And what you need to know, if, if you're selling them to where if you accidentally get a bull bread in that first group, it's going to be a bad deal, then you might want to wait 10 days if you're AIing to a Charley bull and turning in black cleanup bulls to where your reputation is on the line. Uh, don't, don't just trust your ultrasounder because <laughs> we screw up sometimes. So leave those bulls out and give us the best chance to do the best job. 
if you're keeping them and one more calf is worth it, whether it's AI or bull bred, wait 24, 48 hours and stick those bulls in. They'll, those shots will be working. They'll be, you can watch and see if they're about done riding, throw your bulls in. For that one that didn't cycle with the cedar, you might as well have your bull out there and let him get her. Perfect. Um, there's some questions about vaccination, uh, Chris, and um, you know Nikki can jump in there too. But um, some questions about you know waiting the 45 days uh, mm -hmm. before breeding, and uh, if you should do that with both the modified live. We used to definitely think it was only modified live. Yeah. 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 I think we're seeing that we want to be careful with our kill vaccines too. Nikki, would you? Isn't that what our latest research is yeah, showing? Yeah, that's what that's what Dr. Perry's um, research showed that it was both the modified live and the inactivated vaccines where you had to wait that forty five days. And I I was not taught that. I was absolutely taught. Actually, I called the company that makes these killed vaccines not very long ago. One of them and said these owners want to give it um, on the day we're breeding, what should we do? And the, the technical service veterinarian told me any cow, any time, go for it. And now I cringe and wonder how much I damage I did that day because we absolutely gave the vaccine on the day we bred. Uh, we didn't have a wreck, but I'm sure we lost a few pregnancies. So I would say it's, it's both. Um, I think we just have to give those cows time to respond to that vaccine or anything else we're doing to them. And I think there was a question too about modified live or killed. Uh, again, I was taught absolutely every heifer needs modified live. Do not take a chance on giving them a killed. I'm having trouble adjusting to the new research that is showing our killed vaccines are better than we thought they were. Um, I do in my own personal herd, there's a lot of right ways to do things. We, the heifers get modified live and then we switch to killed in the cow herd. I'm still really comfortable with that, but I think we've got some really, really good vaccines out there, and I would not make a blanket statement of killed or modified live. On I can just tell you some protocols that really work, and all vaccines are not created equally. So uh, talk to your talk to your vet, find a vet that stays up on the research, because again, I I've changed a lot of things in the last few years, and if you aren't out there finding the research and reading it. Um, there's some things that I, I do not do anymore because <laughs> it's, it's really changed. We're learning all the time. So make sure you're working with people who understand that and maybe aren't just doing what we've done for 20 years because we've done it for 20 years. We're, we're learning every day. Perfect. Perfect answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's a question about uh, preparing this, the portable semen tank. Uh, before placing the straws from the main tank. Um, how soon do you do that? And um, when do you move straws? I guess, can you talk about that? I, I know you guys move straws quite often. Yeah. <laughs> uh, especially for those large type uh, yeah. breeding pro uh, programs. Yeah. Nikki, do you have a good answer? Or do you want me to attempt it? No, no, go ahead. Um, I'm assuming we're talking about the actual small shipper tanks with the portable tanks. Yeah. So I don't, I don't use those. Um, I believe on those, you, you put the nitrogen in it and it should cool off fairly quickly to where you can start adding your semen. Um, I, I use actual stored, I might move it from my bigger tank to my small tank. So I don't have to carry that into the field. Um, so it's, I don't, and maybe not the one to answer that the more I'm thinking about it. But I thought you dump the nitrogen in and it cools it pretty, pretty quickly to where you can put your straws in. So do you move um, straws the day you're going to breed? For example, even for the, you have a bigger tank. Yeah. Um, the day you're going to yeah. breed, you move into a smaller one. That's what you I move. move it the night before, because again, we're always preparing for worst case scenarios. So <laughs> when I get called to, go do a crazy C-section on a feedlot calf um, and I've got 500 head of heifers waiting for me. We, we want to be prepared. And I do, we, we use a lot of big tanks with like a 200, 250 straw capacity in a can. I don't like taking those out to the field. You're lifting that up and down so many times you have a lot lot of semen in there. So I do like to move it over to a smaller tank where we might only have a hundred straws in a can. 
so it's not coming up and down quite so many times as we're breeding. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Um, there is a question, maybe Nikki, because um, I, I don't think Christina, you work with so much uh, Bosinicus cattle in South Dakota. No. Um, you might you might do once in a while. Um, there is a question about um, the protocol that we have for, and I can jump in there too, but um, for the Bosinicus cattle. Uh, that it changed between uh, more recently. I think it was actually in 2020 or 19 that we changed that protocol. Um, have you? Do you have people um, using that protocol, and um, is it seem to work okay? We up here in the Midwest, we definitely don't have people using this protocol. But what I would say is that. If the protocol has changed on the protocol sheet, it's because research has shown that this newer way to handle these animals is better. So they wouldn't change it if it was worse, they would only change it if it was better or it made sense handling wise or time wise or cost wise or something like that. So if you're happy doing it the way you have been doing it and you're getting good results, I mean, you can keep doing that if you'd like to. Our updated protocol just shows what we think is, is the better option. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was kind of like the five day that had the eight hour processing landing. Oh, two, um, yeah. I believe that's that's what uh, the difference was that now it's just a one injection. Yeah. yeah, and um, I believe that, that Dr. Gary Williams that, that did most of that research and I think it, it just shows that there's no difference. And a lot of people were not giving the two, the two processing landing uh, injections and still being pretty successful. So it reduced one handling. And that eight hour part is just uh, can be a pain sometimes, right? Um, so I believe that's why that change was was done. Um, but yeah, um, and again, you know, trust um, trust the group. I guess uh, we do look over a lot of research before we make any recommendations and, and changes. Um, so when using heat detection, when do you breed? How many hours after detecting in heat? Well, for conventional semen, we generally do the AM PM rule where you detect them in heat and you breed 12 hours later. So if you detect them in heat in the morning, you breed them in the in the evening and vice versa, evening or morning. But if you're talking about sex semen, then that window is extended a little bit and the Beef Reproduction Task Force currently recommends 16 to 22 hours after standing heat. Um, I thought it was pretty cool, uh, Christina, that you share some of the um, the sex semen uh, data. And, and so I'm curious about how many clients, how many producers you guys have that are actually using sex semen uh, in beef cattle. And are those commercial or those, um, you know, purebred people? Yep, yep. Uh, my people, trying to think here, are all commercial. Some of it is they're not breeding any cows. They're just AIing their heifers. And their whole point is to raise replacement heifers. So they just want to maximize every, every AI pregnancy because they're not getting enough of them to only keep AI replacement heifers. So that's probably the most common is actually female, uh, females is their goal. And usually, usually just on heifers. Now we've got one guy this year that wants Simcross cleanup bulls. I can't find what he's looking for. So he's using male symbol on, on one particular group of his cows to raise his own cleanup bull. Uh, some places, not very many, are, are picking their best cows. And it really varies what their goal is. I would say we're pretty split between whether males or females are more important to them. Um, yeah, it's it's more. Uh, one guy is sex male Charlay this year on half of the herd and black female on everything else. He the only black thing that that he wants there is is a good heifer to put that char bull on. So it is all over the board. Yeah, and from from a sales point of view, yeah, we have definitely seen a big increase in sex semen over the past couple of years. A lot of a lot of beef producers are using it. 
And yeah, a lot a lot of female semen, but we're seeing an increase in our, our male semen as well, because even our commercial guys are realizing that, you know, they can get a little bit more money at the at the time of, you know, marketing or slaughter for these these steers. Um, there's a question about cedars and, um, you know, keeping cedars clean. And um, can you guys share a little bit about what, how do you put cedars and what your guys' protocol, how can you, um, I guess, what's the, the procedure do you guys do now? Uh, Christina's the best one. person to answer this because her protocol yeah. is great. All right, Chris. Well, it's, it's pretty simple, not rocket science. We got two pails of water with us beside the chute with a little bit of a pretty weak disinfectant. I'm trying to be cautious in what I use. Um, the, the cedar gun goes in what we call the dirty pail, get most of the junk off of it. Then it goes into the other pail of clean water with a little disinfectant. I don't open those bags of cedars before you need them. It's really easy to throw all 100 on the table. Um, just take that. An extra second and just put 10 out, sometimes even five, and you can save a whole lot of dust and dirt and grime. Think about, I mean, it's going in your cow. It, it's not that hard to just take a second and make sure it's clean. I used to not be nearly this careful, but you, you treat a few infections and it makes you be a little more cautious. Um, yeah, and change your water. Don't, I mean, two pails doesn't do you any good if you use the same two pails the whole day. So dump it out. Just just take the extra minute to do those simple little things and you'll make us look good when we come to breed them, even if it had nothing to do with what we did. Yeah, well, you know, what I would add is it's like we do the same thing, right? Having the two um, the, the two buckets of water and changing water after, you know, 100 and some cows or right, as needed, um, especially like spring cows now, they just like, you know, they get just very, they get dirty quick. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, I want to say that there's there's research that shows that one, um, if you if you use those protocols and uh, keep things clean, um, that if vaginitis, right, it's very temporary. They clean out really quick. Most cows, by the time we do AI, right, which usually take forty eight hours to sixty hours after AI, after the cedar removal, most of them are pretty clean, um, if not completely clean. Um, so. So yeah, uh, there, there's a question about using antibiotics with that. And there's so much concern about antibiotic resistant and like really um, you know, using antibiotics responsibly. So I, I think we can do a good job without antibiotics and keeping things clean. And again, that, that vaginitis um, doesn't affect fertility um, when it's really mild, which is usually what we get, right? Um, so, um, so yeah cleaning, changing waters, uh, cleaning the gun, right? Not just like, that's what I tell students too, like just dumping the, the gun in the water doesn't do much good. If the whole gun is dirty, you gotta clean the whole gun, right? Uh, and, and wash the whole gun in, in the bucket and so on. But yeah, the two buckets work miracles for sure. Um, guys, I think um, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, this was amazing. Really appreciate, um, you know, the different perspectives, um, you know, the history of success, the not so uh, good, good times and, and sharing those and uh, the difference between being successful and not so successful with AI. Um, so I really appreciate your guys' perspective on, on this. Um, enjoy the webinar. Again, I want to remind everybody that this was recorded uh, and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, here in the next few days. Uh, Nikki, Christina, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. This was fun to do. Appreciate all the questions too. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the best part of these webinars is all the questions, right? Um, so thanks again, everybody. Uh, have a good night uh, and keep an eye on our YouTube channel and our Facebook. Uh, we will post it as soon as we get this edited and, um, and ready on our channel. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next month with another webinar. Have a good night.